there's a runner out there that runs nine minute miles every day, day after day. I think that's concerning because your, your paces should vary. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best minds in the sport so you can train smarter, stay healthy, and run faster now. And now your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me today for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. Last week, we heard from Pamela Hinton about the importance of iron for runners. I know we all got a lot out of that one, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of today's episode too. So today I thought I would bring on a foot and ankle surgery specialist. One of the most common areas runners have pain are their feet. There's so much going on there, so I thought it would be helpful to hear from a specialist in that area. My guest today is Dr. Nick Campatelli. He is a podiatrist based in Akron, Ohio, who specializes in foot and ankle surgery. He has a focus on fixing form by looking at the whole body, not just as the feet. You're going to hear a lot more about that in the interview. I know a lot of you are interested in this. He lectures nationally on running injuries, shoes, running form and training. And I love his blog, I'm sure you will too, which is completely up to date and has comprehensive information about all about the science. It's great. So today, Dr. Nick and I are going to talk about how to avoid some of the most common foot injuries, when to use custom orthotics and when to stay away, and why ignoring your posterior tibial tendonitis could be putting you at risk of arthritis. Kind of scary there. Oh, and one more thing he talked about, why flip-flops and especially Converse may not actually be as bad for you as you think. Are you ready to get to the interview? Let's do it. Welcome, Dr. Nick. Hi, thanks for having me. It's exciting, fun. I'm excited to have you. And uh, just for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Nick actually has a blog. Uh, His full name is Dr. Nick Campatelli. Uh, For those of you who may have actually uh, seen him for treatments, but he actually has a popular blog, which uh, is how I first came across him. And so I thought he would be a great guest to come on the show today. So you work uh, primarily, or from what I see, primarily with runners. But are you a runner yourself? Yeah, actually, my practice is more surgical based and was Mm -hmm. more general podiatry and surgical based practice. And the running was more of a hobby, which then intertwined with my practice. And as a result of treating runners, writing about running and starting my running blog, my practice has kind of evolved into, into treating runners as well. So I'm actually a runner myself. I've ran for most of my life, although I never ran competitively in high school or college. It was just more of a hobby. And it's a hobby that's actually grown. I actually run more now than I have when I was younger. Okay, good. And what is your favorite distance? Probably the marathon. The marathon? How many have you done? uh, Ten. I think I just did my tenth one this past week, two weeks ago. Uh, And I think it's fun because it's for several reasons. One, it's not a well-studied event, meaning, you know, most runners only do two a year. I'm just generalizing. When, when you're looking at the elite, some of them, if they're doing more, they're really only putting all of their effort into one or two. And after you've ran one, the things that didn't work, you, you only really have, you have like six months to try to refine them before you do a second one. And there's just so many variables. It's really hard to, I guess, control all those variables and see what works for the next one that you try. So is that, is that what kind of interests you the most about running? Is it based off the marathon or is there something else? I think it's just a fun sport. It's a relaxing sport. Anyone can do it. You don't need equipment. It's inexpensive. So when you say, I'm just curious, when you say about, um, you know, anyone can do it, I've read a few things recently, which I do not agree with, but they say, you know, um, you uh, recreational runners like shouldn't be out there because you know if you're running five six hours then your body isn't made for it and you know they're, they're putting them too much at risk of injury so it's I find it interesting that you've kind of said you know that anyone can do it so you do encourage anyone to run yeah I mean if someone can walk then they can run mm-hmm. when you look at someone's foot type to say oh look at their foot type they can't run I mean I would just disagree with that if they're able to walk then they should be able to run. Now, if they're walking with limitations and limping and a gait abnormality, then that's different. But if somebody can walk within normal limits, then they can run. You brought up something that's interesting in regards to someone that is running for five or six hours. They, you know, shouldn't be out there that long. They could get injured. I mean, that's subjective and can be debated. 
I think running for five or six hours is fine if your body is accustomed to it. You know, there's that's like saying if someone only runs three minutes a day to make the same statement of that they should never run 30 minutes. I mean, mm. if someone's running for five or six hours and they've only trained for an hour or two, I would agree. And I think the same goes for when you see all these programs that are popular on runner's world and online that say train for a marathon in three months or six months, I think that's a recipe for disaster. I mean, it doesn't take, you can't train for a marathon in three or six months. You can, it's not healthy or safe. You can refine your running in three to six months, but a marathon preparation takes years in my opinion. Interesting. So you would, you would recommend if someone out there listening is kind of, you know, seeing like all those things about marathon and thinking, oh, maybe I can do it. You would say, you know, maybe stick to some 5Ks for a while and then some 10Ks and halves and slowly work your way up. Like if, if, if someone was starting running completely from scratch, how long would you say like in a healthy way it would be good to keep training before you actually attempt a marathon? At least a year, okay. at least. And I would make no comparison to a 5K in a marathon. I think they're like comparing apples to oranges <laughs> the excitement you'll get out of a 5k can be comparable to a marathon for some people or the desire that you get to run after competing in a 5k but when you do a 5k and say i think i want to train for a marathon now i i understand the desire that could come from that but they're completely two separate races i mean i i really would stand by it takes at least a year to prepare for that no i'm not saying you can't do one after you've trained for three months. But if you, if you came to me with all these injuries and you only prepared for three months and you ran a marathon and you have this problem and that problem, I would expect it mm -hmm. versus someone that trained for a year or two. Okay. Well, that makes, yeah, that makes total sense. So working with uh, feet, I mean, that's a tough area. There's, you know, so many things going on. Uh, but what, what recommendations would you have to runners uh, who do have some kind of foot pain? Is there a way you can self-diagnose or is that, an area you just really need to leave to the specialist? You, you can certainly self-diagnose. I think most runners, if they're going to have a foot problem that would fall into the category of self-diagnosing, it would be plantar fasciitis. And that's just the, the classic heel pain or arch pain. When you wake up in the morning and you first get out of bed, it hurts. And then it kind of eases up and feels better. Or if you've been sitting for a while in your car or at your desk and then you go to stand up, it hurts. That's classic plantar fasciitis. If it's heel pain that's not resolving and it's chronic, it's there all the time and it doesn't get better as you warm up or, or loosen up the foot or the other musculature of your legs, then they could be questionable for a stress fracture of your heel, which are very rare, by the way. A lot of people will say, hey, I was treated for a heel stress fracture. And you know, I ask, well, how was it diagnosed? Well, you know, clinically, it wasn't getting better. And they took an x-ray and thought I must have a stress fracture. That's not necessarily, I mean, you need an MRI really to diagnose one. So I would say to answer your question, plantar fasciitis can, can be self-diagnosed and is typically improved with stretching and strengthening the foot. But, but aside from that, I look at running injuries as if it's the foot, the knee, the leg, I kind of categorize them all as most of them come from training pattern errors, overuse, and just not following your traditional running patterns that should be followed. So if someone, you know, it's, it's hard to generalize to get this point across, but if, if you take a person that's used to running, I don't know, their races, let's say their marathon pace is a nine minute mile, or, or if there's a runner out there that runs nine minute miles every day, day after day. I think that's concerning because your, your paces should vary. And when we don't vary our paces and when we continue to run at the same pace day in and day out, or if we run, some people will say, I didn't feel like I got a good workout and they run as hard as they possibly can for 30 minutes. I think that's a the concern or recipe for injury. And I think when you look at the sport of running, you know, it's very fascinating when we look at injury rates especially over the last 50 years. But I think one of the worst things to happen to this sport is the GPS watch because now you have people that knew nothing about pace. Now they know everything about pace. And I, I, I'm going to stereotype a little bit. A lot of females that run and they run together because it's their social time. I mean, men do as well, but a lot of females, especially my wife included, will get into these large running groups and it's some of it's based off of one person's pace. So there might be eight mm -hmm. runners that are in this group and that runner might look at her watch and say, Oh, we need to speed up. We're running nine 30 and we should be running 
at a nine minute pace. Well, there's eight runners and they all could be running at different paces. And just because they're trying to stay at that same nine minute pace, that's not healthy. And, and that could lead to problems. And then when they present to a, to the doctor with heel pain, very few physicians will say, well, what's your typical pace? And are you doing interval training? Are you doing speed work? Most of them will have, you know, especially podiatry, they, we get in this category of, well, let me see your arch. And, you know, well, you, you should have this shoe type. Well, how many miles are on that shoe? And really those should get pushed to the bottom. It's more of training patterns that I tend to focus on. Interesting. And when you said, just out of curiosity, you said about, uh, you know, people running the same thing every day, is that more from the aspect of, um, you know, most people, like the example you gave where most people end up running like a somewhat steady state run where it's kind of too, it's not hard, but it's not easy. And is it that most people fall into that category or are you saying, you know, the same risk comes to someone who runs very easy every day? Very few people run easy every day. And I think the ones that do and are getting injured probably aren't running easy enough. <laughs> my <Okay>. thought. <laughs> now, those that run that same steady state, they are getting injured because if you look at physiology, our body adapts to stress placed upon it and it needs rest to adapt to that stress. So there would arguably have to be some stress applied during an easy steady state run if it's the same steady state every day. And if you're not using the next day or subsequent days to rest, then your body isn't responding to the, the physiology laws that we know to, to build up muscle or to build up strength. Mm -hmm. So you need days of rest following days of, of heavy activity. And then, it, so then it will become debatable as well. She is running or he is running easy every day. Then it becomes subjective as are they truly running easy? And then you need some type of objective finding, which would be a heart rate monitor. Mm -hmm. And when you look at studying running, people used to discuss the VO2 max. And I think now we know heart rate is more predictable of fitness as opposed to VO2 max. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been trying to kind of put that across. I, I feel like uh, the running world in general is kind of getting that point into uh, people's heads about how, you know, how easy you have to run. I was actually talking to someone yesterday about um, running easy and her race pace, I think, is about eight minutes per mile. And she was saying, yeah, but on my recovery days, I run nine minutes. And I said, yeah, but that's still not, I said, you probably should be running 10 minutes. I exactly. said, you know, I'm a, I'm a six minute marathon pace girl and my easy days are eight and a half minutes. So that's, you know, I, I try to put it across, but I think it's difficult for people to see. But I think things are starting to slowly move in the right direction. If you feel like you're, you know, moving on the spot, then you're probably getting about to where you should be for that for those true easy days, like you said. Um, and then so what what are the most foot, uh, common foot injuries you come across? I mean, plantar fasciitis, obviously, you've mentioned that. But what are some other ones that you see quite a lot? Oh, I see a wide range of everything. Okay. When you look at the foot, you know, it, it, probably one of the more detrimental ones is posterior tibial tendonitis, which sometimes gets classified into shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome. And I would, you know, warn you runners out there that currently have this. And well, first of all, what is it? It's pain along the inside of your ankle. Or if you, if you feel your foot or your ankle bone toward the inside of your ankle, there's a tendon just behind it or posterior to it. And that's the posterior tibial tendon. And if it gets overused, you need to rest it. And, and I will let most of my runners continue to run with injuries, but that's one where they need to rest it. And surprisingly, two to three weeks of immobilizing it versus six to eight weeks of battling through it is will, will far outweigh running through it. So, so why is that one so dangerous? Because it's a major, I don't want to use the word supporter of the arch. It's, it stabilizes the subtalar joint, which you could say supports the arch. But it's, a, it's an important tendon and muscle in regards to foot stability. And if you lose that stability, the heel will start to collapse. And when that happens, you're looking at midfoot arthritis and, and irreversible type of damage. Because it's, it's one thing to repair the tendon, but when the tendon fails and you end up with arch problems or bony problems, then you're looking at reconstruction or fusions. Oh, wow. Now, some will say, well, I have that posterior tibial tendon, nice, but I use an orthotic to control the motion. Well, you, you can, but the only true way to control subtalar joint motion and to, to control it in a st stable or good way is with a brace, an ankle foot orthosis that has an orthotic built into an ankle brace 
that's going to control the subtalar joint. Now, people say, well, you can't run with that. Well, that's true. So you either splint it and then mobilize it all together and then go back into running. But I, I would caution people who use an orthotic that, that has that type of problem and continuing to run because the orthotic is just not strong. And I shouldn't even use the term strong enough. It's not, you're, you're not controlling motion with that. You're just putting a device in a shoe that is blocking certain aspects of motion. And some of the new literature is actually saying it's causing the foot to move in a different manner than if it weren't there. Is it truly controlling subtalar joint motion? Not exactly. Interesting. And so uh, when it comes to that kind of pain, what level, like on a scale of one to 10, uh, pain, you know, with for someone behind their ankle, would you say to let it get to before you take that time off? And that's very, that's tough to say, and it's very subjective. But one test that I use is if you can't stand in place and hop up and down on your foot 10 times, you shouldn't be running. Okay. If you're getting pain with jumping up and down, because running is a single legged sport. Yes. If you can't hop up and down on one leg, it's not safe to run. Okay. Okay. That's good advice. Not if you can't, it's just not safe. <laughs> No, that's good. That's a good way to judge it. And anyone, you know, who is having that kind of pain, give it a try. And, you know, this is someone who really knows their stuff here. So make sure you listen. So then what about custom orthotics? You said a little bit about that, but just about about for other cases, what are your thoughts on, yeah, either custom or, you know, the Dr. Scholl or whatever it may be, orthotics? So a lot of the studies currently, and even if you go back into the 80s, they look at orthotics, custom versus over the counter, and there's really not much of a difference in terms of overall injury rates. So to start with, do you need a custom or an over the counter? Studies aren't conclusive as to which ones are better. And secondly, you, you need to find a true pathology to be using that insert. So if, if someone comes in with plantar fasciitis and you're, you're put into an orthotic, it may help their plantar fasciitis, but it's like throwing paint against the wall. It may stick, it may not, it may form a pattern you like, or it may not. That orthotic, there's no scientific reason as to what that orthotic is doing. Now, some people do get benefits with plantar fasciitis because it causes some immobilization to the foot, and it does splint the arch a little bit, and that may help their plantar fasciitis, but I wouldn't encourage them to use it forever. If you're looking at splinting the foot to make it feel better, then a cam walker, a cast, crutches, staying off the foot is ultimately better, better, excuse me, better than an orthotic, although orthotics can, can sometimes help that. Now, if, if you're one of the people that says, well, when I stand, I don't have an arch, so I'm using this insert because that's what they told me in the shoe store. That's very subjective and, and hasn't. it's not scientific. There's no scientific evidence that we even need to be putting inserts into our shoes if we don't have any ailments or injuries. So the old paradigm of fitting shoes based on foot types is kind of has been proven not scientific. So there's literature published that shows if you're fitting shoe gear or running shoes based on foot type, it's not scientific and it's not shown or been proven to reduce injury. So with that said, we think now that foot types are more variants than they are of pathology. So if someone has a flat foot, it may be a variant of a foot type more so than a true pathologic foot. Now, if someone stands and you look at their foot and one of them is severely flattened and pushing out to one side as compared to the other one, that might be pathologic. It might require an orthotic or some type of control to assist it. But then I would even go as so far as to say, well, that person may... They shouldn't possibly not be running as a result of having such a deformed foot, which could sound like a drastic generalization, but there aren't that many people out there with these severe deformities. A lot of people present to me that say, I have a flat foot, I'm in an orthotic, and they really don't have a flat foot. Whether they self-diagnose that or someone in the shoe store has said that they look like they have a flat foot, it might not be pathologic. And then, so say someone is going to go to a, a shoe store and they want to know if the kind of, if the person working there is, you know, knowledgeable enough to be able to give them the correct kind of shoes. Uh, you just mentioned one example there, but are there any other things people should look out for? Like if someone's telling them, you know, uh, a specific thing and then they're saying, well, I don't know uh, whether I should be listening to you because, you know, uh, obviously politely maybe like i'll oh, come back and get it but uh what other things should people watch out for in running stores sure that's an excellent question um 
the representatives and salespeople in these shoe stores should be well versed on the shoes. In terms of fitting a shoe based on foot type, again, that's an old paradigm that wasn't scientifically proven. So if they're following that paradigm, I would not listen to them or, or take the shoe based on that advice. If they tell you that this is the shoe for your foot and then you put it on and it feels uncomfortable, that's a good sign that you shouldn't buy it. A lot of the new literature is looking at if it feels comfortable, if it's very flexible and has some cushion to it and it feels good on your foot, it's probably better for your foot than one that's rigid and stiff and has a lot of motion control or, or extra cushion because that could be inhibiting your natural running patterns. So we're finding that cushion is actually playing, I shouldn't say cushion, it's comfort is playing a more of a, of a better role in fitting a shoe than the old paradigm of foot types. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, we have actually had quite a few people recently who have talked about that. So that's, that's good to hear you say that as well. And then what are your thoughts on like minimalist, kind of the transition to minimalist? Do you think people should be trying to slowly move their way over there? Or what are your thoughts? <laughs> that's a great question. So if, if you've done your research on me or if other people have talked to you about myself or my early philosophies in running, I had a big involvement in, I guess we'll call it minimalism, when Vibram Five Fingers came out. And what those shoes did basically changed our running industry and the entire shoe industry, and it has carried over. So when that shoe came out, it taught myself and many other runners to look at the foot in terms of a moving natural and relying on your foot and your body to adapt to what's it has and has been given and run in a more normal or natural state. Now, everyone, you, you can't say that everyone should run with proper form. Everyone's proper form is different and unique to themselves. But when you remove shoe gear, you can adapt to that natural form or your proper form. So what minimalist shoes, and I, I will still categorize it to that, and then I'll explain how we're getting away from it. Minimalist shoes allow the body to run in a more normal manner. They let your foot strike in a more normal manner. You don't rely on cushion. If your foot's getting sore, you feel it and you should back off. Now, when five fingers or the early, let's just say five fingers, when they first came out, that was it. Every other running shoe aside from racing flats had thick cushioned soles, elevated heels and and midfoot motion control. When they came out, and people started running in them, the running shoe industry stood back and looked at this and said, hey, well, a lot of people want this type of shoe. Even if that was the best shoe available and every shoe manufacturer had to change to that, it would have been impossible because you would see an implosion of their industry because they can't just switch designs knowing that one is right because two things would happen. People that still wanted that shoe that weren't knowledgeable of this would now no longer be getting a shoe. And two, economically they would never survive because they wouldn't be able to sell anything because people that want the shoes that they're no longer selling aren't in existence so people would stop coming to them so you can't see that type of change so then what happened was they started redesigning their shoe so shoes are now if if you look i just lectured two or three weeks ago to the indiana podiatric medical association and i talked about what's happened to the running shoe over 30 years and we've seen heel height or the heel drop decrease from what was used to be like 14 millimeters is now down to like eight to 10. So since five fingers came out and I'm not giving them sole credit for it, but it happened at that time, Mm -hmm. we saw shoe companies moving away from elevated heels, cushion shoes, motion control shoes to more flexible and flatter shoes. Are they truly minimalist shoes? Uh, You know, I don't know. I think that's a bad word now because certain people are saying, oh, you can't run in a minimalist shoe. And then they're in one, not knowing it. <laughs> so Blaze and his group of people out of Canada, I think it's like Blaze Dubois, they published an article on what would be categorized as a true minimalist shoe. And I think this is some great uh, lead work into categorizing and looking at shoes closer in detail. But I think what, what you saw happen was the entire industry changed and we're seeing a paradigm shift now to a more flexible shoe that doesn't have as much of a heel height. So what's my position on minimalism? I think it's what everyone else has seen. We're seeing less of a heel, more flexible shoe take over. 
and shoes are now being created in a more natural form. Although, what about the like the hokas and the ultra ultras, and you know, it seems like now it's almost swinging the other way. Have you kind of had yeah. thoughts on those? So. If you look solely at literature, you can't believe that the hoka is the best for you because it's heavy. And we know that when you increase mass, you decrease efficiency. Now, some people have argued this and studies can go both ways. But what I think has happened with the hokas, one is they're not evidence-based. They became popular because one person liked them and they showed their friend, their friend liked them and they showed that friend and so on and so on and more people wanted them. And that drove the demand up to the shoe sellers and the, and the shoe manufacturers and shoe stores. So, hey, these people are buying the shoe. Let's get more of them. And then they sold more of them. And then Ultra saw what Hoka was doing. And, hey, let's make more of those because those are selling. Th that's one thing that I think happened. And the second thing that I think happened is it's a, it's a flatter shoe that's very wide. And it, the foot is striking inside the shoe. So it's almost as if you're running with a natural form because, yeah, you can heel strike a little bit, but you still are landing inside that shoe, mm -hmm. which is very flexible and soft. It's not rigid. So I think it changed the way people ran inadvertently, and it's helping some people. Is it the right shoe for everyone? I don't think anyone should run in it, mm -hmm. personally. I mean, I've worn them. I, I wore mine a few weeks ago after my marathon because my everything just hurt and I was tired and they're kind of, I, I call them a cam walker for shoes because you can kind of roll off of them to run. But I think you're, you're, you're pushing the body in a state that's not normal. Now, what about the ultra runners that are doing hundred miles in them? I don't know. I mean, it's working for them. So, so maybe there is a place for it. And I think it's working and that place is there because the foot's striking inside that shoe and we're not using it in the way we use motion control shoes. Hmm. Interesting. I have actually heard a few people say what you said as well, that they like them, you know, the day after a race and they're great for recovery, like a, mm -hmm. a few days after when you're sore. Okay. And one more thing about shoes I kind of wanted to ask. What about uh, casual shoes? Now we know uh, that those can do a lot of damage if you're wearing shoes that aren't good for your feet. Um, but what are, what are some thoughts on that? And then what are the best shoes you would recommend for runners who are, you know, out working and can't wear running shoes or Maybe they even shouldn't wear running shoes. Yeah. So one word summarizes that. They need to be flat. There's no, uh, we use the word again, scientific evidence for putting any type of height under our heel. So a men's, you know, we, we, we blast women all the time for wearing bad shoes, but men actually wear shoes that are just as bad, if not worse, than women's shoes. Men's dress shoes that have a block heel put the foot at an angle. So instead of your foot being flat the way it was either designed or evolved to be, and you know, that brings up another point, evolution. So for those that, you know, they say, and I don't want to turn this into a creativity versus evolution matter, but people that will, the, the naysayers of the flat minimalist shoe that say, well, our foot evolved to, to be in a running shoe. I mean, that's, that's hogwash. <laughs> evolution doesn't happen over 50 years, <laughs> millions of years. So we've only had, evolution as those people will say it from the 70s up until now so our foot did not evolve we've been pushed into the shoe as a result of the industry which is creating injury so back to being flat our foot was designed or evolved or created whatever you want to say to be flat when you introduce a heel under it it puts you in this position there's a term called equinus or ankle equinus where the ankle joint is lacking that ability to, to dorsiflex so if you put a foot in this position and then say, well, it's pathologic if you can't move it this much, and now you add a heel, you're inducing a pathology to a normal foot. And I just, just lectured on this to my colleagues who without a doubt will agree with me that ankle equine is pathologic, but these same people, which by definition would become hypocrites, put, put their patients in running shoes that have high elevated heels, so they're inducing an equinus. So back to what, what I tell my patients to wear that are having issues or to dress shoes, it should be flat. And there are flat dress shoes out there. Vivo Barefoot makes a wonderful dress shoe that looks stylish and is flat. And they have a large line of casual shoes that are flat. And other companies are coming out with them. And even if you're, you're just shopping in your everyday shoe store, in your local department store, make sure there's not a large heel and that it's flat. It might not say zero drop, but inspect it a little bit. Google online what zero drop should be and look at your options. I've had men cut heels off of dress shoes. I've cut my heels off of dress shoes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work as well, but it's better than wearing a 
a shoe with a elevated heel. And uh, I think I read somewhere that you uh, you were talking about Converse. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, do you want to just explain to everyone uh, that what you found in that article you did about Converse? I just they're a popular shoe, and I think one of the reasons why they're they're popular one is they're trendy, but they're one of the old school athletic shoes that were flat and did not have an elevated heel. And, you know, they are flexible. They do have a, a little bit of a narrow forefoot, which I don't like. And the shoe itself is kind of narrow, which could create problems. But they're flat. And I think that's why a lot of people gravitated toward them. And then they became trendy. And I think one of the worst things that I think Reebok owns them now. I'm not sure. They're owned by someone. But one of the worst things that could have happened now is they created the new Chuck Taylor that has an insert in it. Oh, uh, really? Soft arch type of insert. So huh. I, I don't know. I mean, I think it, they didn't change the overall design too much, but I think there's a removable insert in it. So if you it's, stick with the originals, you're good. I, I would say. Okay, good. I, I, I was I was really interested to see that because I have tons of pairs of Converse. I love them. And I, they're the only the only casual shoes I've found that I can wear for long periods of time. Once yes. you wear them in and get rid of those blisters that I always seem to get at the back. Um, they're the only ones that uh, I can wear walking around like all day and not actually feel any kind of pain in my foot. So I, I was glad to see you say that. You'll probably like this comment as well. Everyone thinks that flip flops are bad. Flip flops themselves are not bad. It's the change in a stability or a shoe that you've been in that has some stability to it all winter. And then springtime comes and you take yourself from a shoe that you're used to performing in, and then you take it away and put a flip-flop on, it changes the way you function. But if you were to take a stability-controlled or whatever, emotion-controlled stability running shoe and compare it to a flip-flop and wear both of them for eight hours a day and line those people next to each other and compare them, the person that wears a flip-flop for eight hours a day for six months will probably be functioning more normal than that person in the shoe. Really? So flip-flops oh. are good if you've been in them for a long time and you're used to being in them because it does let your foot function. Yeah, if you're if you're ambulating and walking in a flip-flop in the same way that you were in a traditional running shoe, that could be bad because you're, you need to change your gait in the way that you're walking mm-hmm. to a more normal strike pattern. And then that flip-flop is just giving you some cushion and protection from the ground. But flip-flops get a bad rap. Hmm. especially from my colleagues yeah no I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that that's interesting maybe that's why you know when you first put on flip-flops after a winter you always get that rubbing in between the toes maybe that's the warning sign that needs to gradually bring them back in <laughs> um okay so let's kind of talk about your um you know your main area here in in surgery like how common is surgery uh within the foot like do you for runners i mean how often would you say a runner needs to have surgery? Very rarely will I do surgery on runners. Most of the foot surgery I do, aside from trauma and diabetic foot salvage or amputations, is elective for bunion procedures and hammer toes. If you have a bunion and you're a runner, can you have it corrected and still run? Absolutely. Um, I, I would say that the most common surgical procedure I do on runners, and this might not sound like surgery, but it's toenail removal. A lot of runners will come in with a abscess under their nail plate or blood collection, which is a hematoma, subungual hematoma under their nail plate. And we just simply remove the toenail to reduce the pressure and let the underlying infection calm and let it heal. And I've had runners come in on a Monday, we take their toenail off and they run that Sunday. I've had soccer players, we take the nail off and a couple days later, they're playing soccer again. So that's probably the number one thing that I would do from an invasive standpoint with runners. Do we operate on plantar fasciitis in runners? I, very rarely. You, most plantar fasciitis can be resolved by strengthening the foot and changing your running patterns. Rarely do we need to operate. Um, I will do ankle arthroscopy for people that have injuries to their ankle joint. Usually those are more traumatic or collision type sports as opposed to running. But those would be the number one types of things that if you're a runner and you had questions about surgery, probably bunion surgeries, you can still have it and still run later in life. It won't prevent you from running. It's a very well-refined surgery that can help people. So, yeah, let's talk about bunions for a minute there. Like, you know, some people are just going to say, oh, you know, it's part of running. But is there 
a way to avoid it? Like, what are your what are the best ways runners can work their way around bunions? Like, if they're in the beginning stage, or what shoes are are the best thing to do for a bunion? Ultra makes a great shoe that's wide. Topo Athletic has a great wide shoe. Anything that's wide and lets that bump or the great toe and all the lesser digits function it is helpful. There's another product out there called Correct Toes by mm -hmm. Ray, Dr. Ray McClanahan. Mm -hmm. And Correct Toes will, you know, some people think, was well, that going to fix my bunion? Well, while you have it on, it straightens it and it puts it in a position that lets the joint function more anatomically correct. So it's putting the toes as opposed to being scrunched together like this. It's allowing them to be spaced the way they were designed to function mm -hmm. and you can function better with those in your shoes. So those are, if you, if you were to ask me what could be done for bunions and runners, aside from surgery, hands down, correct toes work really well. Um, what, and with combined with, or just wearing a, a wider shoe. Okay. Okay. That's good. I actually, uh, I have the Saucony Triumph, uh, which I actually really like as well. And they've got like a wider and I think it's called ISO fit where it like, allows your foot to splay out and I definitely can feel the difference in my toes and just they feel more comfortable not being like squished in that little toe box. The analogy that I make is if you're doing a push-up and you have your hands like this, mm -hmm. it's hard because you'll wobble. So yeah. when we do a push-up, we do this yeah. and our hands become more stable. It's simple physics. If your foot has its toes squished together like this versus splayed, the long flexor tendons that flex the toes have a better mechanical advantage when they're splayed than when they're squished together. That makes sense. So you will function with a stronger and wider based foot when the toes are working individualized as opposed to like this. Yeah, that makes total sense. Okay, great. All right, very good help there. And then just before we go on, a few more common foot issues. Uh, what about like a black toenail? Um, when when runners get you know the the blood blister under their under their toenails and the toenail begins to fall off, is that just a, a natural part of running, something you can expect, or is there is there something you can do about it and, you know, ways to avoid it? <laughs> great question. I was going to tell you that's another great common injury yeah. I see in runners. So to answer your first question, is it normal? Well, or is it normal with runners, I guess we should say. A black toenail with bleeding and trauma is never normal. So... Some will say, well, I always get this from running because I have a long second toe. It's possible, but myself and many, many other runners can complete marathons without subungal hematomas or toenail issues. So we know that it's not a part of running. So then what's causing it? It's either too tight of a shoe, and our society, again, tends to wear too tight-fitting shoes for whatever reason. I don't know. I know a lot of the specialty shoe stores tend to fit shoes larger because they know that a, lar a larger shoe is better for you but you should have a, a, a at least a thumb's length between the end of your toe and your shoe mm -hmm. so that the, the toes can move and have have room so you're either wearing too tight of a shoe or the opposite effect of you could have too large of a shoe and your foot sliding and jamming in the end of the shoe and then it becomes normal for you over time that this feels normal or comfortable so some people will lace up their shoes and they say oh these feel nice and snug this is the perfect fit when they're actually too tight and that constant running of 20 some miles can cause the jamming or it could be your strike pattern which is causing your toes to jam up against the end of the shoe when you land which is causing the trauma so you might say yeah but i can i can run a sub three hour marathon nothing else is wrong but i'm getting black toenails so then i would say well then you have to weigh <laughs> if you're running mm -hmm. that well and that's the least of your worries then it is normal for you but I would hypothesize that we could tweak something to fix those digits from jamming to stop it from happening, but then you might affect your time. Mm -hmm. One thing also I wanted to ask your opinion on this that I've heard, um, I actually had my first toenail fall off a few months ago, first one ever, uh, and I was wondering what it was, but um, I can't remember who it was. Some told me someone who we inter I interviewed on the podcast before told me about um, they thought it was a lot of plyometrics or like speed work when you're not used to it because you're you know that your that force is going to like jam your again it's the jamming the toes into the shoe box. But have you heard anything about that being you know plyometrics or like jumping and things? 
I don't see it more associated with plyometrics. And in my practice, I see it more with the the marathon Mm -hmm. and the ultra runs where it's just that constant micro trauma that's creating it. Okay. I mean, I suppose you could see it from plyometric type activity, but I would say I I see it more anecdotally in in just people that are performing longer type events. Okay. Okay, great. Um, And then I just wanted to kind of talk a bit more about, you know, your your blog and um, what you kind of do. So you... From what I see, you pick articles that you find helpful, write a short like blurb about why, and then share uh, what you have found. So you've become like this great resource, especially for, uh, I know I share a lot of your articles on the Runners Connect social media and for other people. Um, but have you, have you found that you've become a place where um, other people can come to trust the information that you share and trust that it's good information? Have you kind of experienced that with other people referencing you a lot? Um, I, I would hope that people are trusting. Yeah, well, we definitely do. <laughs> you know, you're right. A lot of it are reposts just to keep the site active because I'm always reading about running. It's a hobby and it keeps keeps me going and I, I enjoy reading. So as I'm reading articles that are out there, I feel that, hey, if I thought it was interesting, I bet other people in the community would. So I tend to repost it and make a small comment. And then when I have time, I like to sit down and, and write my own posts about what I think is fascinating or how I'm treating people lately. That's been kind of stagnant. I'm starting another blog that's it's called the foot doc blog, which is, I think it's live, but really no reason to go there yet because things aren't completely categorized, but it's more of what we see from day to day in the office because I found that, you know, I take pictures of everything and I document everything that I do because I lecture. So when you, when you show some people, you know, this is what we see. It becomes a 30 minute long conversation because pictures, you know, speak a thousand words. So it'll be an interesting adjunct to to show what we see in the office along with my running blog. So that's why it's kind of become stagnant lately in terms of my original posts. But I like to review items, shoes, give my own inputs on different running products or gadgets that have been sent to me. But the, the focus that I like to have on the blog are injuries, training patterns, and just helping people run. And sometimes, you know, dispelling myths about water or hydration or coffee Mm -hmm. or pasta the night before a marathon. You know, I think so many, there are so many new runners that still rely on tradition as opposed to science and they're doing things that aren't exactly correct. And it's sometimes nice to kind of guide people into their help straighten out their thinking a little bit on, on, in terms of what they're doing. Yeah. So I like to look at the site of people think that I'm just a podiatrist and I'm only looking at feet. It's not necessarily true in regards to running. And I think with running, more people have foot problems that they blame on their feet that are actually coming from running and they end up in my office. So mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of nice to educate people on running and sometimes it helps their foot problem. Yeah, no, I, I love the variety of articles that you post. And uh, I will put a link to the show in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC77. So I would encourage any listeners to go check it out. And I wanted to uh, for you to kind of tell, talk a little bit, if you can still remember about it. You did a post about running a negative split. Uh, and why it's so important. We've kind of dispelled the myth of like time in the bank does not work, but I kind of wanted you to explain your your th- thoughts on it just as I found you, that post really interesting. Well, you really do read what I put <laughs> So some will say that if you keep reserve in your tank for the fir- from the first half of the marathon, you can then run the second half and utilize that reserve and run it faster. Now that Physiologically speaking, that is, that's true and it makes sense. The challenge is how much can you reserve and how do you know how to reserve, reserve a certain amount to then use it in the second half? That, that's one challenge. The second thing is there's been some people that have looked at this and found that even the elite runners who are running negative splits aren't doing it purposely. So what they're doing is they're running their first one kind of reserved and then the second one is reserved up until the last several miles and those last several miles make their second split negative. So while the negative split makes sense physiologically speaking and does work, I don't think you can use the term or the philosophy to PR every time. So I think for some runners, even like myself, I know I could, if, if there's two things that I think you could do, if you run your, if you, run your first 18 to 20 miles as hard as you can. Now I say as hard as you can. 
That doesn't mean collapse at mile 12 or 14. I'm saying you run a constant steady pace as hard as you can to 20 or 22. Then, you know, you can just kind of mosey your way in from four to 26. Very so painfully. That's painful. <laughs> so you're not getting a negative split, but you're getting a PR. But you could use the another way of doing it is running. We know that if you can see the hard part is finding what that pace is. The other thing is what I was going to lead into. If you run a constant pace, mile one to mile 26, that is is better than running a negative split. And why? Well, because you're 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 keeping your body at that homeostatic pace to, to make it all the way to the end. And then maybe the last couple of miles you could pick it up and run a little bit faster, which would theoretically give you a negative split. But it's not I think people see it as okay, it's mile thirteen point three mm. two, whatever. It's time to pick it up now mm -hmm. to run that second half faster. I wouldn't look at it that way. I mean, I would look at it as focus on conserving your pace the entire way through and try to run a steady pace. I think if you looked and, and there's a, I posted it somewhere. You can probably find it on, on my blog, but this guy looked at so many thousands of runners and compared their times. And there aren't that many people that are in the top that are running negative splits or running constant paces. And those that do get a negative splits coming from the last several miles. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. And, and I, uh, when I ran the London marathon earlier this year, I, I kept my pace uh, constant without a Garmin, uh, not looking at that, just trusting <laughs> yes. in my body. Yeah, no, I've, I've learned my lesson with that one. Um, and then, you know, picked it up the last, uh, you know, well, I think it was about five miles, but um, I managed to pass 91 people in those, in those five miles. That so fun? that just shows, you know, that what you're just saying works very well in that um, you can, if you are consistent and you stick with it and, you know, just pick it up towards the end, that's when you can cut off that time. So, yeah, I, I just was interested to hear your theory there. Um, so if you, I just to finish this off, I wanted to ask you if you could give, this is going to be difficult, one piece of advice to all runners out there listening based on your experience, uh, what would it be and why? Slow down, rest, and have fun. Great so advice. You know, I think it's Matt Fitzgerald that published the book 80-20. Yeah. You know, 80% of your run should be easy and 20% and should be hard. And if you're doing it the opposite way, it's not going to be fun. You're not going to improve and you're probably going to get injured. So run easy, have fun, and, and you need rest. So if, if it's the week before a marathon and you want to, you know, I really believe you could take three weeks off before a marathon and still do well. And some people are so stressed and, you know, yeah, you might want to go out and loosen the legs up a few weeks or a few days before, but really physiologically speaking, there's not much to gain the, first, the last couple of weeks before a marathon. So rest is also important when it comes to running. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as much as people have enjoyed listening, talking to you today, they don't really want to end up in your office. <laughs> So, um, one more thing that I didn't <laughs> is, is sleep. Yeah. We all ignore sleep. And, you know, if you are type A and you, you, you know, went to bed at midnight and had to get up to get your kids ready and you only had five hours of sleep, you probably shouldn't run that morning. You should probably go back to bed or get your rest. And the next day you'll have a better run. Whereas if you had a, if you had a long run scheduled and a hard workout scheduled and you only had five hours of sleep, I'd prefer you to sleep or go back to bed or get longer sleep and do that run the next day when your body's recovered because you will get more benefits out of it. The hard part is actually doing that. <laughs> so I, I'll try to that too. Yeah, I think we've all, we've all done that a few times, been guilty of it. Um, okay, and then just one more question. You've mentioned about the Correctos, but any other products you would recommend for us? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> product speaking. You know, I don't know. There's so many good products out there. Okay. I think that Stay away from gimmicks. If a shoe costs over $200 for a running shoe, be a little wary of it. If it has some new technology, be a little, you know, I, I would stray away from that. I like heart rate monitors. I know Mio Global makes a great heart rate monitor for your wrist. It's an infrared technology. They're probably one of the leading, the, their heart rate monitor, their technology probably leads the industry in, mm -hmm. in terms of working and being reliable. It's Mio Global. Apple's heart rate monitor, well, well, first of all, as much as I love Apple, they did not make a running watch. No. Their heart rate monitor is pretty decent. I still think Mio Global's is a little better, 
it, it's hard to say. I've, I've tried. And just when I think my Apple Watch heart rate's working perfectly, I go back to my Mio. And, but that's one category that I tend to look at a lot are the heart rate monitors mm-hmm. because I love looking at my heart rate while I run. But I also want something that's reliable and comfortable and, yeah. and works well. Um, but in terms of, I like just getting out there and running with, with no watch sometimes, no headphones, no music, less of a shoe, and just enjoying the surroundings and the environment and, and having fun. Yep, great advice there. Okay, and um, if someone wants to find you, uh, what would you say the best way to, if they want to be in touch with you, would it be to go to your website or where would you like to people to reach I out? would direct people to my blog. It's drnicksrunningblog.com. And even if you don't remember the URL, just Google Dr. Nick's running blog and you'll find it. You can reach me there. My, I have a, an email there that it's feet at me.com where you can reach out to me. But I would prefer you just make a comment on the website because then I can respond. And then other people, the other thousands of people that go there can read those comments. Yeah. Because sometimes it's the comments that other people read and helps guide people's thinking and their problems. So please just comment on my blog if you can. And I do respond. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to talk today. And uh, I've really enjoyed this. And I hope you have enjoyed talking today too. I have. Thank you very much for having me on here. This was great. And it's my pleasure. I, honor. It's an honor that you reached out to, to interview me. Oh, of course. He's great, isn't he? You can tell he's just so smart and so knowledgeable, but he just loves to help runners. And as he is a runner himself, he understands what we do when we do when it comes to injuries. Now, will you do me a favor? I've set up a quick and easy online survey to help me improve the podcast. I promise it's not going to take a long time, but it will really help me to give you a better podcast. And you'll be able to share your requests for future guests in addition to a variety of other things. You know I listen to your feedback, well hopefully you do by now, and this will really allow me to see what you want. So to do this, all you need to do is go to runnersconnect.net forward slash listen. You get it? Listen, because I'm listening to you. (laughs) I'd really appreciate it. And don't forget, you can now text me to get the latest news from Runners Connect by texting TINA, T-I-N-A, to 66866. That's 66866 depending on how you say it there. I thought I'd make it nice and easy. I'm looking forward to reading your responses. And if you go to the survey, remember that's runnersconnect.net forward slash listen. You'll be able to put in whatever you think and also answer some questions for me. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. Have a great week.